book of Ephesians divides itself up into two separate sections. Uh, Chapters one through three, if you're taking notes, is all about our identity in Jesus. And, And what Paul is doing in chapters one through three is he's walking us through who we used to be before we knew Jesus, that we were without hope, but Jesus came and he rescued us and loved us and he adopted us into his family. And then beginning in chapter four through chapter six, it's all about living out our identity in Jesus. And Paul gets uber practical and he talks about what that looks like in our marriage and parenting and singleness in our church, in our finances, our career, our decisions. And so that's where we are today, where Paul here is really encouraging us to live out who God says we already are. So with that, let's just dive in. Verse 17, Paul says this, so I tell you, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, verse 20, is not the way of life you have learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and in holiness. Verse 25, therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Oh my goodness, I wish we had about three hours together to unpack this. This is so, so good, so convicting. Um, Paul says, look, you have a new identity. You're, you're loved by God, and because of love, he says, we shouldn't live the way that we used to live. Think back to your BC days, your before Christ days, and, and think about how you lived and the words you said and the places you went. Paul says, that was the old you, but when you encountered Jesus, you became a new creation, and now he says that we are to live a life of holiness. Now, I know a lot of people, when they hear the word holiness, they kind of put their guard up or whatever, but really the word holy simply means to be devoted to God, to be devoted to God. Now, when Paul wrote these words 2,000 years ago, He was writing into a culture, into a context, into a time where there was so much temptation and there was so much that was warring against living a life of holiness. I remember a few weeks ago, we talked about Artemis. Artemis was the goddess that they worshiped in Ephesus. And this was a city known for its liberal sexual ethic. Um, Artemis was the goddess of sex, basically. And people would come from miles around to worship. Only the way that they worshiped was through sexual acts with prostitutes, male and female and, and slaves. And this was part of how they thought Artemis wanted to be worship. This was endemic to the culture. And on top of that, um, it was very normal in that culture for a lack of commitment and faithfulness in marriage. In fact, the average man, history now tells us, had about four or so or more women in his life. So he would have a wife, but then he'd have three or four lovers that were on the side. And that back then was considered totally normal, totally acceptable. In fact, they, they had a word for it. They called it pornea, which is where we get our English word for porn, for pornography. And if you didn't agree uh, with this kind of sexual ethic, if you had different convictions, in Ephesus, you were considered backwards. You were considered intolerant. Why wouldn't you support our way of life? So this is the culture that Paul is writing to. And I want you to notice right off the, off the bat, the way that Paul uh, describes it. Verse 17, he says, 
they have futile minds. Verse 18, living in darkness, separated from God, they're ignorant. Verse 19, they've lost sensitivity. They are full of greed. So tell us what you really think, Paul, right? He's, and he's so honest. Um, I, I love that Paul isn't politically correct here. He's not like, oh, I don't wanna step on any toes or burn any bridges. No, he just very clearly, very boldly says, that way of life will destroy you. Sin is gonna tear you apart. In fact, notice the word if you're a note taker, um, and if you're not a note taker, just repent right now and become one. Um, the word futile in the Greek uh, is a fascinating word. It's mateotes, mateotes. And, and the reason I have us think about it, write it down, is, is because it means without purpose, aimless, empty, and hopeless, which I think is a perfect description of the Patriots' chances of winning the Super Bowl next week, right? <laughs> It's what Paul had in mind when, when he wrote this. But it's even more, it's a description of the life of, of sin. That, that life without God is a life of hopelessness. Paul is arguing the further you get from God, the further you get away from meaning. And the further you get away from meaning, the emptier your life becomes. Um, I don't know if any of you like philosophy books, but I was, I was reading Aldous Huxley uh, this last week, <laughs> a little light reading. Um, Aldous Huxley, he wrote Brave New World, which is a fascinating, like, he wrote it a while back, but I think it describes so much of the hedonism of our culture. But Aldous Huxley was a self-proclaimed agnostic and didn't believe in God, and in his book, Ends and Means, Alder Suxley has kind of this moment of transparency and honesty, and he's talking about why he chose to believe agnosticism. And, and, and at one point he said this, I chose to believe it because it delivered me from trying to find meaning, and it freed me to my own erotic passions. Isn't that interesting? Huxley admits here, he says, look, a life without God, sure, it is a life without meaning. There, there, there's no compass that, that's guiding you. There's nothing, no foundation beneath you. But he says, the flip side is that I'm free to do whatever I want. <laughs> and he says, I, I can now pursue my own erotic passions. Now, what Huxley calls freedom and, and what many in our culture call freedom Paul would argue, and he says, actually, it's, it's futile. A life without God, a, a life just living for your own erotic passions, a, a life of sin, actually is a long descent into emptiness. And Frederick Nietzsche was, was an atheist, or he would call himself a nihilist. And from his atheism, the further he got down that path, the more he too identified this. And at one point, Nietzsche said that life without God is the equivalent of staring into a dark pit. And the more you stare into that pit, it begins to stare into you. So there's something corrosive that happens as sin begins to eat away at your soul. A life without God, subtracts meaning, and without meaning, it's dehumanizing, right? Because part of being human is a desire to discover meaning and purpose and direction in our life. And Paul is saying here that by definition, that is what sin will do. It will lead you in your singleness or in your marriage or in your family to pain, to brokenness, to emptiness. It will lead a culture, a nation, to futility. And you know what, as a pastor, I'm reminded of this constantly, and, and you all can relate to this too. It, doesn't it seem like the, the older you get in life, the more you're reminded of just how horrific and stupid sin is, uh, whether it's in your own life or in the lives of, of people that you know? And, and you look at your parents, or you look at your brother, you look at someone you're living with, and you just see what, what sin does to them. And the more you see of sin, it's like, you become repulsed by it, like, oh, it's an ugly thing that, that seems to be so appealing and, in, and enticing at first, but then you go down that path and it robs you of joy. It robs you of hope. It robs you of meaning. You know, part of my job is I, I sit down and meet with people and I hear stories. And I've heard so many stories of what sin 
does. And I've seen so many tears, even this last week, of what sin does. And I tell you what, I have never heard, I've never heard anyone come up to me and say, you know, Dom, I am so thankful for the sin in my life. You know, it's just such a blessing. I am so glad, Dominic, I got addicted to that and now it's controlling me. It's just awesome. I'm so glad I slept with her. I'm so glad I had that affair. I have never heard that. But what I have heard are people saying, why? Why did I go there? Why did I do that? Why did I get involved with that? And there's regret, right? We, we've all experienced that. Why, why did I allow that sin to control me. And that's what Paul is simply wanting to alert us to. He's pulling back the mask of sin and he's exposing it in its hideousness and its ugliness and saying that that's what it really is. And you go down that path, it will tear you apart. Um, Last week, after our noon gathering, um, I went to uh, 24-hour fitness, and um, I, saw, I like to go in there between gatherings, just kind of because you get tired after doing a few, and you got to get your mind sharp and focused, and so I go to the, the gym, and I'm working out, and this guy comes up to me last week and taps me in the shoulder. I take out my headphones, and he's like, hey, are, are you Dominic? I'm like, yes. He says, can I talk to you? And I say, yeah, sure. And so we start talking, and within seconds, he's just weeping, just tears are flowing. And I'm like, what's, what's going on? And he starts to share with me some of his story, and it was heartbreaking. He's like, I made some mistakes. I did some things I shouldn't have done. My marriage now is falling apart. And he's like, ah, oh, I don't know if God's angry with me. I don't even know if I should pray anymore. I just feel so horrible. My life is going nowhere. And just, he's just speaking all these negative thoughts, right? And, and I, I grabbed him by the shoulder. It's like this really intense upper moment. I grabbed him by the shoulder. I'm like, okay, you gotta stop right there. Because what you're saying about yourself and what the enemy is trying to put in your ear right now, it's lies. There is forgiveness, I said. There is, there is grace. And with Jesus, he, there can be a second, a, a second start for you and even for your marriage. And, and so it's like this intense moment. My hands are on his shoulder right in the middle of the gym. Like, bro, do you even lift, right? And, <laughs> and we just start, we start talking. The tears are flowing. And then I'm like, okay, let me pray for you. And and so I pray for him, and, and you know, people are looking at us, like lifting weights nervously, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? But it was such a reminder to me, first of all, around you, even, even right now, people sitting around you, you go to Costco, go downtown, you go to the gym, all around you are people who are hurting and broken, who are just a conversation away from a breakthrough, a conversation away from a, a moment where you can pray for them and speak healing and truth into their life. But it was also yet another reminder to me of how stupid sin is, of how destructive sin is. Uh, C.S. Lewis, he said, sin, it actually robs us of our humanity. We become less of the imago Dei the further down the path of sin we become. He, he talks about that in The Great Divorce. Or I love this quote um, by Alfred Tennyson. I don't know if there's any poetry fans here, but he's like this super eloquent guy, but then he has this line. It's not really eloquent, but I love it because it's so true. Uh, Alfred Tennyson said, sin is too stupid to see beyond itself. How true is that, right? Sin is, is it's five minutes of pleasure for a lifetime of pain. It's destructive, it's myopic, it's short-sighted. Proverbs 6 says, can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? And how many of us, we've come here to this gathering today, myself included, our feet have been seared by sin. We've, we've all messed up. All have sinned and fallen short of, of the glory of God. We, we've all done things that we regret. And maybe for you, part of your story is you've come here for maybe a week of just mistakes or yesterday, last night, or maybe years and years of addiction to something, anger, greed, jealousy, pornography, whatever. And you've come here today and it feels like you've been walking on hot coals. You feel how sin is just eroding your soul right now. And can you see then why, why Paul would say, put off the old you. 
Put on the, the new you. The, the phrase put off in the Greek is, is the phrase apatithemai, apatithemai. And I love it. It means to renounce something or to throw it away. It's like when you're opening up the fridge and kind of digging in the back. And have you ever found something that's been there for like, what, five years or something? It's old and moldy. I mean, unless you're a college guy, you throw it away, right? <laughs> you see it there and like, okay, get rid of this. You, you, don't, want, you don't even want to touch it. And, and Paul is saying that should be how we respond to sin, that when we see sin in our lives, we don't want to just let it be there, just festering and moldy and destroying our lives. He says, renounce it. Call it out. Let the light of God in. Now, I know, I know that <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir here because 99% of you are like, yeah, I know this, Tom. I'm like, sure, sin stinks, right? Sin messes up lives. We, we all have the scars of it. Here's the question that I want to wrestle through before we go today. How? H- how? Paul says, put off the old you, put on the old. Okay, that sounds great. How do we do that? Like, what does that look like practically? What does that look like in our nine to five? What does that look like as we walk out the door today? I am really, really glad you asked that because Paul shares with us two practical ways. I encourage you, write this down. For me, these, these things are literally just changing the way I live and the way I look at things. I'd say especially this first point um, and, and that my prayer is that this can be a turning moment for, for many of you. How do we put off the old? Number one, we need to think true thoughts. Think true thoughts. And I want to draw your attention to verse 22. Paul says, put off the old self, put on the new. How? Be made new, where? In the attitude of your minds. Notice this, this is, this is huge. The battle for holiness begins with our thought life. It's the stuff we allow into our minds, the things that we dwell on. Those things will shape you. Those things will influence the way that you live. You know, in 2 Corinthians 10, Paul says the weapons that we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Paul says, we're in a battle. We're at war. You might think, yeah, I'm a battle with my wife. I'm a battle with my kids. No, no, your primary battle isn't against people. It's not against families, not against nations. The battle that we're all in is a battle for the mind. This is the greatest battle. In fact, Paul uses this fascinating word stronghold, uh, which is the word ohirama in the Greek. And it can be translated as a castle of the mind, a consistent, highly structured pattern of thinking. Every moment your mind is inundated with thoughts. Scientists tell us we get between 30 to 50 thoughts per minute. And some of these thoughts are awesome. They're, they're life-giving, they're, they're true, but some thoughts are destructive. Some are negative, some are false, whether it's lust or anger or jealousy or anxiety, fear. And, and here, here's the deal, this is what happens. The more that we dwell on a thought, the longer we allow that thought precedent in our mind, the more it becomes a stronghold. Every thought that we dwell on, that we don't take captive to the obedience to Christ, that we allow and we we dwell on it for an extended period of time, it's like a brick. It's a brick that day by day, month by month, year by year, if you allow those thoughts to reign unhindered in your mind, becomes a stronghold and it gets bigger, and lust looms larger, and addictions, we wonder, how can we beat it? And in time, whether it's anger, fear, whatever, in time, that strong, you no longer control it. Now, at one point, you thought you did. Big deal, I I can go to that website. Big deal, I I can allow myself to be in those places. I, I can control this. We all try and justify sin that way, right? 
the more you dwell on it, you're building a stronghold. So what, what kind of stronghold are you building now? And what if for some of us here today, that thing that you, you've allowed your mind to go there year after year after year, you thought you could control it, but now, if you're honest, it is controlling you. It's calling the shots. When it calls, you respond. You're the slave of sin. What we think about determines who we become. I, lo I love this quote. Be careful of your thoughts, for your thoughts become your words. Be careful of your words, because your words become your deeds. Be careful of your deeds, your deeds become habits. Be careful of your habits, your habits become character, and be careful of your character, for your character becomes your destiny. N notice, what you think about will shape and influence who you become. And you think, oh, I'm just 20, big deal, or I'm 17, it's all right, I've got this. No, I promise you, <laughs> you go down that path and you allow that thing to have dominion over you, it will shape who you are at 40. And it will control who you are at 60. It begins right now, the battle for the mind. Paul says, take it captive. But here's the deal. I cannot control what thoughts come into my mind. You, you can't control it either. Like every moment, we're, we're getting thoughts. For example, if, <laughs> if I tell you, no matter what, do not think about a purple llama. <laughs> it's done. There he is. It's right here on the stage, right? Or if I were to tell you, don't think of that song, Call Me Maybe. Now, just by saying that, some of you have the song in your mind and you hate me for that reason, right? So we get all these thoughts. It, it, it's true. We cannot control what thoughts come into our mind. But here's the deal you can control what you do with that thought. You cannot stop the birds from circling over your head, but you can stop a bird from building a nest in your hair, right? And here's the deal. The enemy is wanting to get in your head. He's wanting to get in my mind because he knows the way he can tear me down is if he can begin to influence and control my thought life. He's the father of lies. And he tells you and me lies about myself, about yourself, about people in your life, about your past, about your future, lie after lie after lie. And God says, you need to take that captive. You need to speak truth into that situation. Philippians 4 says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about, think about such things. Paul is challenging us here to think about what we think about. And when we sink our mind with truth, okay, what is true about this situation? What is true and lovely and pure is this trajectory of thought leading me in a way that is gonna be life-giving? Or is it going to lead me down a path that is destructive? Do you wanna put off the old you? Do you wanna put on the new you? Do you wanna live out your identity, who Jesus says you already are? It, it starts right now, Th this second. Right now, your thought life, the battle can be won or lost. So we begin there, number two. Not only do we need to, to think true thoughts, but number two, we need to speak true words. Speak true words. And I draw your attention to verse 25. Um, he says, therefore, so in light of all these things, put off the old, put on the new, therefore, put off falsehood. Speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Now, I wrestled with this this last week because this is not the direction I thought Paul would go in. Of all the things that he could have said about how to put off the old, put on the new, he puts speaking truth and talks about lying at the top of the list. But then I realize how wise this is, how true it is. Why would he say speak true words? Because words matter. <laughs> what you say about yourself matters. 
The stories you tell yourself matter. What you say to others and about others matter. Words, words can create a context for God's spirit and kingdom to flourish or be controlled whether or not we're thinking thoughts that are in line with his word and his heart. I mean, think, think, think how powerful words are. Genesis says, in the beginning, God created. How? Through words. With words, God spoke reality into existence. And here's the deal. When you speak lies, you're creating a reality that is out of sync with the heart of God. <laughs> when you speak lies, you're limiting your potential to live out of who you are, a new creation. And to be honest, every one of us, we do this all the time. We struggle with lying. Blatant lies, white lies, half-truths, lies we tell about ourselves, lies about others. If you're like Dominic, not me. And I'm holy. I don't lie. This isn't a struggle for me. Well, you just did. In the words of Elf, you sit on a throne of lies, right? <laughs> we all wrestle with this. In fact, Blaise Pascal, I, I, he's an amazing uh, thinker. He said, <laughs> most relationships are based on mutual deception, so if you're single, just pray about remaining single. Um, and I, I read that. I'm like, really? That's like so pessimistic. And then I did some research. Do you, do you know that science tells us that up to 10% of communication in, uh, between spouses is deceptive in, in some way? Another study said that up to 38% of interaction between college students contains lies. It's called Instagram, right? Um, we lie to av avoid embarrassment. We lie to save money. We lie because we want people to feel sorry for us. We lie because we want to disguise something we've done wrong. We lie to exaggerate accomplishments. I in Christianese, we lie too. Stretch the story. Give God the glory, right? Have you ever done that? We, we lie to avoid awkward conversations. I mean, how many of us, even in the four minutes, how are you? And you're like, oh, great. And maybe you're not. Maybe you need someone to pray with you. Lying is so easy. And yet, what Paul is saying is that it's destructive. Why is it destructive? Because lying denies people access to the real you. Lying creates a boundary between perception and reality. Lying erodes trust in relationship. Lying is the engine that fuels addiction. Lying sabotages sincerity and integrity. Lying creates the need to tell more lies. Now, I know we can all relate to this. I won't ask you to raise your hand because you'll probably lie. But how many of us have, we've, we've told something that isn't quite the truth and because we, we said it, then we have to lie later on to try and keep the lie afloat, right? I was talking to a friend not too long ago. And he's like, Dom, I have a great story for you. He and his wife, they wanted to go downtown for a date. They call up an Uber. The Uber shows up at their house. They, they walk outside. As they're walking outside, his wife turns to him. He's like, sweetie, did you put the cat out? And he's like, oh, no, I forgot. He goes back in. She gets inside the Uber car and for whatever reason, she felt kind of sketched out a little bit by the driver, and she didn't want the driver to know that the house was going to be left empty. So, so she lied. She's like, well, you know, my husband just went to go say goodbye to my mom. Well, he gets in the car uh, a couple minutes later and just walks in real loudly, just gets in. He's like, oh, sorry, I, I was so late. He said, the stupid thing was hiding under the bed, and I had to get a broom to get her out. <laughs> The Uber driver's like, what? Who are these people, right? See, that's what lying does. It complicates things. And, and what Paul is saying here is that, hey, when you step into truth, there's simplicity. Truth means you can be yourself at every moment. Truth means that you can be real and authentic. Truth is what empowers you to put off the old and put on the new. Truth creates an environment for God's spirit to heal you. You know, in the book of James chapter five, James would say, confess your sin to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. If you're taking notes, the word confess, just write this down. Confess means to speak the truth 
to speak the truth, when you confess your sin to one another, when you pray for one another, there's healing. Sin's greatest strength is secrecy. I prayed with someone after the 8 a.m. They're like, oh, I'm struggling with lust. I really just need, I need prayer, and this is how I'm wrestling with it. Really honest, really open. And he's like, I want to be set free. And I'm like, just by confessing it, just by calling it out, that sin is losing some of its strength and grip on your life. Confess, and in the process of doing it, there's healing. But I don't wanna confess, join the club, I don't either. I hate admitting to my wife that I was wrong about something, or my West Side community, ah, oh, I need prayer. For, I, I don't like that. I mean, how many of us like that? We don't like putting ourselves in a, in a bad light. Confession is hard. The truth will offend you. The truth will unsettle you, but then the truth will set you free. And that is why Paul is writing this. Because he wants those people 2,000 years ago to experience freedom, life the way that it was meant to be lived. And he wants us now in 2017 to be free from the corrosive, destructive effects of sin and to experience life as the new humanity. Think true thoughts because it begins there. Where, where's your thought life? And speak true words. How do I do that? It's scripture. Your word is truth, Jesus said in the Gospel of John. When, when you get that thought, speak scripture. Pray, God, give me victory. Speak truth to others. I'm struggling with this. You know, Dave Scriven's over here. He runs 423 Men, which is an incredible ministry for men who are struggling with, with addictions, sexual addictions. And he has seen dozens and dozens of men be set free from that just through this simple principle of confession, speaking truth, and experiencing the life the way that it was meant to be lived. And here, here's the question I, I wanna ask all of us today. What would it look like for you, for me, to put off the old and to put on the new? What does it look like in your life? What does it look like in your family, with your roommates, with your marriage? You know, for some of us, it, it is a need to confess. You've been living with a lie for a long, a long time, perhaps, it's had a grip on you, and, and it's just because you haven't yet been honest about it. You haven't been honest to others. You, you haven't been honest to those close to you. Look, I'm struggling with this. Look, I, I need help here. And because you're keeping it hidden, it continues to control you. You know, after every gathering, we have our prayer room that's open. If you need prayer for anything today, if you need to just confess your sin today, I wanna give you that opportunity. There are men and women there and they just wanna speak truth over your life. You're like, I, I don't know if I wanna tell them what I've done. Listen, trust me, we've heard it all. We've heard it all. You won't surprise us. Instead, what you're gonna find is grace and healing, forgiveness, scripture, plugging you into a group, giving you resources so that you can grow in freedom. Maybe for some, that is just a practical way that you can do what Paul is telling you to do. Maybe for others of us, you've just been listening to lies of the enemy. How many of us do? I do this all the time. The enemy's wanting to whisper in our ears, you're not good enough, you may as well give up, throw in the towel, and brings up your past or being, brings up your struggles. Maybe it's a miracle that you're here today. And it, you just can't believe you're sitting in church right now because of the week that you lived and the mistakes that you made. And even just coming in here and hearing the songs and being surrounded by a bunch of Christians are like, ah, I'm not worthy of this, right? But that is so from the pit of hell. It's the enemy, the father of lies, who's trying to rip you apart. And what Paul says in Ephesians is that the truest thing about you is you are a new creation. The old is gone, all things are made new. I don't feel like a new creation, that's true. But that's who God says you are and he wants you to empower you to go and live it out. Look, we are not the people who we wanna be, but praise God, you're not the person you used to be. He began a work in you and he will be faithful to complete it. Finally, maybe there's some here today and you just need to, be empowered to know 
that that sin no longer has victory over you. Do you realize the chains are already broken? Do you realize the prison door is already open? And we can begin to live into that victory by thinking true thoughts and speaking true words. Remember Augustine? A, a, a few weeks ago, I talked about his, his conversion story. He's an amazing guy, incredible thinker, theologian, articulate. He wrote a book called Confessions and this massive book called The City of God. And I'm not exaggerating, it's huge. But, but Augustine, before he knew Jesus, he was a philosopher and a sex addict at the same time. So he's like deep thinker, but really struggling just with lust. He had all these women in his life. He then meets Jesus. Jesus changes him. The desire is still there, but by God's spirit, he's giving him victory. And Augustine was transformed. Well, true story. A couple years after his conversion to Jesus, he runs into someone, a, a mistress from his past. Now, how many, how many of us have had this happen? Hopefully not a mistress from your past, but maybe, where you run into someone at Costco and it's like your old days, right? Your BC days and it's kind of like awkward thing. Like, hey, what are you doing this weekend? Church, right? And, and he has this moment, this girl comes up to him, really attractive and she's flirting with him. She's like, hey, August, what, what are you doing? What are you up to? What are you doing tonight? You should come over. And she's like trying to seduce him. And Augustine was like really polite, respectful, but he, he said no. He then turns away. I've, I've got to go. He turns away, and she is so confused. Like, I don't remember him that way at all. And she calls out after him. True story. She says, but Augustine, it is I. And he turns around, and he said, I know, but it is not I. And maybe for some of us today, the enemy's been coming after you, trying to tempt you and drag you down and destroy your marriage and your family and your singleness and your potential and the beauty of what God is wanting to unfold in your life. And he's speaking lies to you and about you. And today, what you need to speak over your life is it is not I. I have been changed. I have been transformed. I am a son. I am a daughter. I am redeemed. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I am set free.